Welcome back to Paranormal. This is our third installment of our series, third and final installment of our series, Quantum Physics and Metaphysics. So this is episode 17. For those of you who are just jumping in here, please go back and listen to the first two. 15, 16, and 17 are the episode numbers. There's three parts to this. So in this episode, we want to focus on entanglement. Uh, That's kind of a, a buzzword in the quantum mechanics metaphysics discussion community. I don't even know if I can call it a community. I guess it's a community uh, out there on the internet. And for those of you who are not familiar, we will again post uh, a, a short video that, that illustrates the point of what, what people are talking about with quantum entanglement and how it leads to statements like, well, if two particles on either side of the universe, you do one thing to one and instantaneously the, the other one, you know, shows the effect of that, that everything is connected. All is one. So we, we get, you know, there, there's, there are a lot of people out there who feel that quantum mechanics at this point is a justification or a proof of monism. This notion that all is one, there's no distinction between the material world, the created world and an external creator. We don't need that idea. Everything is one. Everything's always been. It'll continue to be. Uh, we don't. We don't have a need for an external creator. There's no creator-creation distinction that you know is is justifiable in our thinking. So entanglement has something to do with that. Uh, we could also sort of extrapolate into some other ideas that I know I've heard, and we'll throw it out to our our, our panel in a moment. Where, well, if everything's connected, then then we're all connected as as spiritual beings, or all spirits are connected in that spirit world, wherever that is. We're connected with them, they're connected with us, we're connected with each other. And we also get into the issue of uh, free will versus determinism. I mean, how how one action, you know, sort of dictates another action. Uh, is this sort of some justification for a deterministic view of the universe? That, do we ever really have independence, uh, you know, or, or autonomy, or something that looks like autonomy? Maybe, maybe some kind of freedom where you know our our lives and who we are and our path, so to speak, is not being dictated by something else going out there, going on out there in the quantum reality. So these are the subjects we want to cover uh, today, and I'm just going to open it up to either our guest Putty Putnam. Uh, can jump in here and with you know some of the things he's heard, or of course our panel. We have Doug Van Dorn, Doug Overmeyer, Trey Strickland, and Natalina Hadushell. So everybody's here, and Brian Gadawa. Everybody's here again, all three times in a row. That's got to be some record. Uh, but let's just, yeah. You know, let me ask you guys. You know what? What kind of things have you heard in relation to entanglement? You know, it makes us cross from the science, you know, quantum mechanics over into the metaphysical realm. I think just what you mentioned, Mike, that if if these things are are entangled, either information is being transmitted faster than light, and we know that can't be the case, or everything is connected, and therefore everything is connected. And I think it's probably a false dichotomy, but you know, I don't know. Uh, So I'm interested in hearing. That's what for. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, like. Is that a false dichotomy? Yep. Anybody well, else? You know, of course, I always bring in the New Age perspective. And when it comes to entanglement, their theory is that since everything is interconnected and quantum physics proves that, and we know how much Putty loves that phrase, um, that since quantum physics backs up this theory that everything is interconnected and everything is one, and we live in this universe of infinite possibilities, which they say quantum physics also proves, then as a result, I, as being connected to everything in this universe, not just other people, but every particle in this universe is connected to me and I to it, then I should be able to visualize an, an outcome that I want to happen in my life and pull it out of this set of infinite possibilities and then manifest it into being um, just because everything is one and I'm part of this grand whole. So ultimately that is the, you know, when you, when you look at um, 
like popular books like The Secret that talk about the law of attraction. They always inject quantum physics and this idea of, of quantum entanglement to back up the idea that we are all part of the larger whole and therefore we have these powers to manipulate reality. It, 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 that ultimately is where it all drives toward. And it's not to me, it sounds like magic, <laughs> you know, the causal engineering, but they will say it's science. So Pretty today is my, uh, today's my 24th anniversary. And so, uh, seen a lot of romantic comedies in my lifetime. And I'm pretty sure that I've never seen one that talks about quantum mechanics, but I'm also pretty <laughs> sure that every single one of them is rooted in quantum mechanics because <laughs> it's all about fatalism and how the two are destined to meet each other and the universe is hooked together. So Putty, you have to answer that question for me. <laughs> I'm sorry. What exactly was that question? <laughs> are all romantic comedies rooted in quantum mechanics? <laughs> uh, okay, sure. <laughs> Anybody else want to jump in? What other kind of odd, quirky sort of ideas have you run into that, again, draw upon or dip into this whole entanglement idea, the whole monistic all-is-one worldview? Well, I have a computer one, actually, since I'm a computer guy. And, buddy, I'm just going to throw this out there, and you can answer this at the end of it. But I understand the communication applications with entanglement, but it's the calculations that interest me. So if you can explain in terms of how we're harnessing quantum mechanics for calculations, I'd, I'd like that. Uh, you're talking about uh, quantum computers? Is that what you're getting at there? Correct. Go ahead and jump in with that one if that's – it's it's a bit off the beaten trail, but it- – if that's a an answerable question, go ahead. Yeah, so we can uh, we we start there. That's fine. Uh, quantum computers are interesting, and um, it is an area of a lot of research and a lot of study over the last oh I don't know fifteen twenty years something like that. Um, quantum computers uh, present a lot of interesting possibilities because they will fundamentally work very different than a normal computer. So a normal computer is basically an extraordinarily complicated machine that um, takes a whole lot of input in the forms of what are called binary numbers, either ones or zeros. All of the, you know, all the keys, all of the pictures, all of that basically gets compressed all the way down to ones or zeros. And then it produces all kinds of results um, based on that input. You're adding numbers together, multiplying them, doing all kinds of fancy things. And all those ones and zeros go through a bunch of hoops, and then they eventually come back out in the screens and the sounds and whatever else it does. Um, What makes quantum computers enticing is that they propose an ability to create a different kind of computer in which you're no longer computing based on one or zero, but you could make computations based on something that is both one and zero at the same time. Um, which is something that our typical computers uh, don't have the capability to do. Um, Now, that winds up kind of running into a lot of ramifications in terms of like how you would use a quantum computer that uh, are sort of interesting. Uh, if, If we were successfully able to create a quantum computer, it would be wonderfully good at solving a set of problems that are very difficult for our normal computers. Um, but it would equally have a whole other set of, uh, problems that our regular computers are actually really good at that it would have a really hard time solving. Um, and so it winds up sort of being a different starting point for building computers. And, uh, the, the advantage or the advantage and or challenge, (laughs) maybe the challenge probably of that is that, um, Often the kinds of things that are very difficult to compute are used uh, advantageously with our computers uh, to keep things protected. So, for example, the ways that financial transactions are run and your you know, uh, credit card information is communicated and whatever uses these kinds of algorithms to keep all your sensitive information safe. 
So they take, you know, all the data and they scramble it in these really complicated ways so that we basically know it's going to be impossible for a normal computer to figure out the data that we would want to be able to figure out. And so, therefore, it's safe. And we can send your credit card information to Amazon.com and you can buy whatever you want to buy. Um, quantum computers will render some of those things trivial to solve. Um, and so a lot of computer security is going to be uh, interesting <laughs> to see what happens if quantum computers are indeed uh, able to be created and if they wind up making their way to the mainstream market. Um, that's uh, an interesting uh, question, you know, as to whether that'll happen and how that works and whatever. Um, but that's not the only reason that people care about that, but it is a reason that it's a significant thing. Uh, my guess would be, by the way, Mike, you mentioned about investing in Bitcoin. My guess would be <laughs> that quantum computers would probably be able to find Bitcoins very easily as well. There so <laughs> might might be a good time to get out of that market. I don't know. Um, <laughs> now, um, I should I should admit, so first of all, I, I did not um, uh, specialize in quantum computing. And so uh, I, I, I'm not as in touch with that field as some other things with respect to quantum mechanics. Um, the quantum creating a quantum computer is going to be a challenge. Um, you know, well, it has been a challenge. It will continue to be a challenge. Um, simply because kind of going back to, um, some of what we talked about in our first conversation and even some of what we're going to talk about today, um, to, to do quantum computers, you have to produce these, these hybrid quantum states that are only possible in quantum mechanical systems, um, things where things are neither left nor right, but they're left and right simultaneously, even though it seems impossible. And you have to keep your uh, your quantum bits in those intermediate quantum mechanical states while you're doing the calculations. Um, and then only at the end kind of resolve them out to observable things where you can kind of look at the answers, so to speak. And it turns out that that's really difficult. It's really difficult to keep your quantum bits in those uh, quantum mechanical hybrid states and not let them sort of rub up against something where they decohere and they kind of lose the intermediate state that you need to be able to do your calculations. And so there's a tremendous amount of time and work and energy that's going into these things um, because, you know, if we ever were to be able to create a quantum computer, we want to do things like save data, you know, and <laughs> stuff like that, that you, you need to be able to run a computer. And right now, you know, we're lucky if we can get these quantum states to be lasting, you know, microseconds and things like that. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of work going into that. From what I understand, there has been a lot of progress um, over the last decade. I actually was talking to someone not too long ago about this, and they were uh, really encouraged by the progress in the field. Um, when I was studying, uh, which is coming up on almost 10 years ago now, there were uh, questions as to whether it would even ever be possible to produce these things. Um, just because it's so complex, it's so technically challenging. Um, and, uh, you know, there was kind of like three or four different directions people were going. I'm sure that's still the case. Uh, my guess would be the prog or the prognosis is a little more positive. People probably, from what I can tell, are thinking that it's likely going to be able to do. But my guess would be is it's going to be a ways out yet before we've got those things happening. Um, and even when we do, it's going to take us a while to figure out what we can and can't do with it. Um, you know, how, how do we actually use these things? Uh, my guess would be for a while they're going to be kind of tools in scientific labs to solve uh, interesting mathematical and, and scientific problems. And then perhaps at some point they'll, they'll make their way to, to an everyday thing. But like I said, they're, they're, they're made to sort of solve a certain class of problem and how exactly that class of problem translates into like everyday person's use for the, you know, the, the very important things we do, like type word documents and, uh, you know, go on Facebook. Uh, it's, it's unclear exactly how all that adds up. So does that uh, speak to any of that for you? <laughs> yeah, I'm just interested in the, you know, like you said, it could be left and right. I mean, it holds all the possibilities at once. So in order to get it to spit out an, spit out an answer, is it is there anything like we talked about in part one of the series? Is it the act of observing it where you actually can get it to spit out an answer? Or can Yeah. You... 
Yeah, no, so that's a great question. Um, you know, quantum mechanics is is inherently statistical. And so when if we're going to use a quantum computer to do a calculation, what we actually need to do is run that calculation about a billion times and look at like the overall um, kind of pattern in the in all the solutions together, if that makes sense. Um, and so you, what you wind up doing is you, you sort of create this interesting setup that um, you're running your quantum state through, you know, some 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 equivalent, very complicated equivalent of like your double slit pattern, you know, but you set a bunch of double slits up in some certain configuration or something so that what's happening is it's actually performing a calculation as it quantum wanders through that mess. And then, yeah, you look at like on the average as you take all, as you run this thing a zillion times, you know, where do the electrons go or the photons or the whatever? Um, and then that tells you something about sort of all possible solutions to the calculation that you ran with the quantum bits and stuff. So you do wind up, yes, making, you wind up doing the computation by making a high number of observations. Let's get back to monism, maybe less exciting unless, you know, we go back to the romantic comedy. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> so what about all this? Everybody's connected. And, and again, this, this, Again, back to romantic comedies, the soft fatalism yeah. uh, of, of that sort of thing. What, how, how should we think about that? Is it legitimate right. to take quantum theory and say such things? Yeah. Well, let's back up even a bit from that and talk just okay. a little bit about what entanglement is, right? Because that's yep. where a lot of these things come from. Um, so entanglement refers to a uh, phenomenon in quantum mechanics where – uh, what happens is you form um, a composite system in such a way where the degrees of freedom in your system are interconnected. Um, and you kind of like on top of that, you wind up uh, taking advantage of the non-binary, uh, the non-either-or nature of quantum mechanics to kind of like set your hybrid system in weird states where it, it's going to produce weird results. Okay. So that, that's, that's a lot of very technical speak. Let me, let me try and uh, maybe illustrate that with an example, right? So electrons, it turns out, and, and most particles, almost every particle have a quantum mechanical property that's called spin. And it, it refers to sort of a quantum mechanical analog of if as if the electron was like rotating um, as it you know moves wherever it moves. And spin has two options. Um, it can uh, basically functionally either be rotating clockwise or counterclockwise, you might say. And you know every electron has this property and every electron is sort of spinning whichever direction it's spinning in the world, you know, um, based on whatever quantum mechanical things it's experiencing. Um, and, you know, because it's quantum mechanics, some are spinning kind of uh, clockwise and counterclockwise simultaneously because that has not been sort of smeared out yet. What you can do if you're clever is you can take two electrons and you can say these two electrons, I'm going to I'm going to kind of massage the two of them and do do some some interesting things to force the combination of these two electrons into a situation where. They're either both spinning clockwise or they're both spinning counterclockwise, but they're not like in opposite directions. Like, so they're both going the same way. I don't know which way that way is, but I know that they're both going the same way. When we have a, a state like that, that's called these two electrons, we call them entangled because their two spins are connected to one another. They're caught up with each other. They're tangled in one another. And what's interesting is we don't know either electron which way it's going. But we know that they're going the same way together whichever way that is, which until you make an observation is kind of both. So both electrons are spinning clockwise and they're both spinning counterclockwise, but neither of them is spinning one way and the other the other way. It's kind of a weird uh, state, if that makes sense. Now, because of the weirdnesses of quantum mechanics, when you make observations, 
your your sort of odd intermediate states wind up disappearing and it condenses to one well-defined state. So when you take your two electrons and you say they're either spinning clockwise or counterclockwise, I don't know which because they're kind of doing both right now. Um, what you can do is you can look at just one of them. And when you look at just one of them, you'll see that it's spinning either clockwise or counterclockwise. Let's say it's spinning clockwise. So I look at electron A and I go, ah, it's spinning clockwise. Well, because the two of these electrons are entangled, as soon as I look at electron A, electron B will be isolated into spinning clockwise. Before that, I couldn't have said that it was spinning clockwise. And in fact, nobody even looked at it. But because this is a kind of a hybrid quantum state where the two of their states are together, observing the one kind of like forces the other one into clarity as well. That's what the the weird thing that we're talking about when we talk about entanglement. Um, and that's where you sort of get the idea that like, oh, these two electrons are connected, you know, they're they're talking to each other somehow and, and whatever, you know, all, all of this sort of comes out of this kind of kind of thing. Do we do we have the same issue here as we did in our first episode with this is an observation and we can't use our observation, see our observation to make an ontological statement about the electrons. Yeah. In other words, the fact that we're observing something really is no commentary on what that thing is or why it's doing what it's doing. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, first of all, I would say that's almost always true in science, probably, <laughs> because science is not ontology. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, what what I'm talking Meta about is- Metaphysics like, is certainly ontology. <laughs> Right. When, when, when we're, what I'm describing is an experimental phenomenon. Again, yeah. it's living in that realm of science. And now, once I start trying to talk about why that's happening, um, particularly in a field as kind of hard to, to nail down as quantum mechanics is in terms of physical meaning and so forth, um, then, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've crossed into philosophy, ontology, metaphysics, something like that. And um, again, you can do that if you want to. It's just that's not science. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think I think that's a that's a that's a good observation. Um, so, you know, to kind of think a little more carefully about, you know, what what statements are reasonable to make about things like entanglement. Um, so entanglement is a is a it's maybe getting close to the epitome of the weirdness of quantum mechanics. It is really strange. Because, you know, it'd be really nice to be able to say, oh, well, when I looked at electron A and I saw that it was spinning clockwise, you know, it was really spinning clockwise all along. And so was electron B. I just didn't know it. And what quantum mechanics tells you is like, eh, that's not actually true. It wasn't spinning clockwise until you looked at it. And neither was electron B. They were both spinning collectively clockwise and both spinning collectively counterclockwise. <laughs> um, but when you look at it, they both fixate in the same state. Um, and that's weird. Like, that's really weird when you think about it, because then you're, you're getting into, into um, what a scientist would call uh, non-locality. Uh, in other words, like something is happening somewhere else uh, and it's like not physically connected to its cause. Um, you know, we don't, we, we don't really like this in the scientific realm, right? Like if you push on me, I want it to be because something contacted me, right? You know, like that we like actions that cause reactions. And um, this is sort of getting into that space where you're like, okay, so if I take electron A and I move it into a different room as electron B, you know, and then I look at it, how does electron B know how to do that? You know, like it, it's weird. I mean, I'll, I'll say that it's it's odd. It's strange, and it is probably the one of the strangest things of of quantum mechanics. Um, so that being said, let's think a little bit about what entanglement is and what makes sense to say about it. What doesn't make sense to say about it. So entanglement often gets used to, as you pointed out, to argue for a kind of monism, like oh, the two electrons are connected in some deep way. They're sort of one and the same, and uh, you know, therefore we're all interconnected or something like that. Now, first of all, this is a big jump in logic. 
Um, not the least of which because uh, entanglement is a manufactured state. So you remember how I said in the beginning, you have to take these two electrons and you have to kind of massage them to get them in this weird state entanglement. Entanglement is not like the default, like if that makes sense, right? Like, so it's a possibility in the quantum space. It is not the default in quantum space. And it is like way too far to say things like everything is entangled with everything else. No, that's not at all true. That, that's very, very far from true. Um, we can create things where things are observably entangled, but you have to work to make it happen. And it's not a permanent state. Once you make that observation and they're both locked into spinning the same direction, then you've observed your quantum system. The entanglement has gone away and now they are independently doing their own thing again. So the massaging that you did to get them in that weird state has been undone. And so entanglement is, is neither universal nor permanent. It's, it's a temporary state. It's a temporary thing that quantum mechanics does. And as such, to me, all the logical errors aside, like you're arguing from like this sort of bizarre corner of the theory that most of the time doesn't apply. And you're saying that that applies to everything everywhere all the time. And, and we just know that that's not true. <laughs> if that makes sense. We know, we know that that's not the case. Um, that, that is awesome. Just like describing that this is a manufactured state and it's not permanent. I mean, th those two statements just help deconstruct the, the whole, therefore, you know, that people make the, the, the tremendous leaps in logic. Yeah. If, yeah. If this and, is a manufactured state, why is the double slit experiment and the and the double slit phenomena not a contrived state? Of, you know, or is it? Yeah. Well, well, the double slit thing is really a separate thing than entanglement. Um, entanglement. You're, you're would still involve... setting up a. You're still setting up an experiment to observe the the particles of light. You know what they do in in each slit. You're you're watching one and not the other. Mm -hmm. So it. Uh, to a layman's ear, the process, you know, the, the experimental procedure sounds similar. So why yeah. is one more contrived than the other? Yeah. So the the, the difference is entanglement um, is not something that you can do with a single particle. Entanglement refers to the collective state of a system. Okay. So you have to have a system to be entangled. And that's why it does it does head towards ideas like we're all one, right? Um, but in general, like I, I see this kind of thinking actually coming out in a number of different ways because what it's actually confusing, in my opinion, is it's confusing the fact that there are times that you can kind of like aggregately describe a number of elements – in a composite system. And there's some ways that that's actually the most useful way to talk about things. But to then say, because you can do that, therefore we're all connected in some deep way is, is, is a misnomer. Okay. So for example, let me, let me just kind of give a real concrete, right? For instance, you know, sometimes it's helpful to talk about humanity as a whole, right? And we are all part of humanity, each and every one of us, right? <laughs> we all fit within that that descriptor of a system that that includes all of us. And you can make statements like, you know, humanity is more intelligent than any other species on the planet, right? Well, we don't take that statement and say, whoa, we're all more intelligent than everyone else. We must be connected to one another, right? Like we must... We're all part of the same thing that has this property. We must be interconnected. Well, functionally, that's what you're doing when, when you're kind of making this jump with entanglement. You're saying, I can produce this kind of property of this system. Therefore, I can draw some conclusion about all the elements of that system. And that's just not a true step in logic. Like you can create a state where a system is entangled with – the the you know that the the elements are entangled but that doesn't mean that those elements are entangled all the time or that it says anything about the nature of those elements it's just 
a, a fact about the system as the composite kind of collection. Does that make sense? I, I feel like I'm using a lot more scientific words than we've used up until now, but I'm, this is so, I should, it's so kind of on that fringe, it's hard to talk about. <laughs> there was a little piece of sophistry, I thought it was, um, on one of the videos. I don't remember if it was one that we were supposed to watch or not, but the guy, he, made, he just made this comment about entanglement that went back to the Big Bang, and he goes, because of the Big Bang, and we all came from the, kind of that one particle, uh, and because entanglement is true, uh, then everything is connected. And so it sounded like he was trying to you know, connect it to some kind of a scientific idea with the Big Bang, but pretty much it was nonsense. Oh, total nonsense. There are like three things wrong with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so, you know, to kind of to kind of circle back, you know, that that idea that like entanglement is real, but it's a manufactured system and it's not a permanent state. And what that means then when you begin to fast forward that is that like you can't really take that as a basis for arguing for monism. Like it you can sure, we can all produce kind of systems where the elements have some kind of shared property that doesn't mean that they're connected to one another. It doesn't mean that there's some deeper root underneath all of them. And what's happening is kind of the weirdness of how quantum mechanics and observation works is blending with the shared properties of elements in a system. And people who aren't thinking carefully take those two things and say, oh, they're 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 somehow talking to each other and then you know they like it's a thing you know like it, it it forces that that correlation of the weird out in an even deeper way if that makes sense <laughs> hey putty a question if uh does entanglement necessitate uh, a human uh, some kind of a mind to put together a system in this way or have they observed entanglement that just appears by accident. Uh, you said some earlier that I, I couldn't quite tell the, the answer was for that. Sure, yeah. Uh, I'm sure that it does happen by accident in some ways. Um, you know, quantum mechanics just kind of all things happen. It's kind of the, the kind of bottom line thinking um, because it's all based on so much uh, like randomness and so forth. Um, I'm sure that it happens to some uh, percentage in nature it's definitely not a front and center phenomenon you know it's a uh, sure it's kind of popping in and out once in a while but it's you know it's not a not an all the time again when you hit these things the question you have to ask yourself is this like if this was connected to like the core thing of the way the universe works why did it take us so long to find this right like so like entanglement, again, wasn't even found in the very beginning of quantum mechanics. Entanglement starts coming in, you know, 30, 40, 50 years after the field is discovered because it's not the default. It's a weird corner of the theory. And so like you've got quantum mechanics, which takes us 300 years of science to find. And you've got entanglement, which is the weird corner of that theory. Like you're getting so far out there that to argue that like this is the way everything is interconnected it's just, uh, it feels like a, it feels like a stretch. <laughs> so thoughts on all of that? I know uh, that one got a little more scientific. <laughs> so, so, I mean, if it's a, if it's a temporary state, and again, I'm using the word contrived because that's the one that pops into my head here, but temporary impermanent state, then I hate to sound so simplistic. Does this apply in any way? <laughs> to to any sort of metaphysical or theological idea because um, you, you could flip this on its head and say well good grief now i feel like the universe is coming apart you know we're all going to die you know nothing's secure the, it, we're going to just we're headed for disintegration you know all this kind of stuff so what right i mean walk us in off the ledge or somebody off the ledge <laughs> and, and 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 what um how does this apply in in you know, sort of in any regard, because, you, you know, you, th this all gets, it does get connected to the all as one thing. And, and this, this not the, the non limitation of non, you know, spatial existence, mm -hmm. which of course goes back into the other dimensions and, and all that kind of stuff. So right, th there's that, I mean, does this apply to any of that? Because, you know, what about precognitive dreams and deja vu? Because you'll often hear these things or read these things discussed, mm -hmm. you know, either utilizing it, utilizing in some way. 
this entanglement idea. Well, there's no real space and time. So your dream, you were able to, to sort of drift out of one dimension into the other. And because of entanglement, you were able to see the future or see the past or you're somehow connected. Right. right. You know, what, what, is there any sort of reasoned trajectory to any of that? Right. Uh, so, right. so, so we, we've run the gamut now. The world's disintegrating right before our eyes, even though we can't see it because what Putty just said about quantum stuff, <laughs> as opposed to everything's connected, you know, intimately, and this explains, you know, this or that, you know, phenomena. Right. So, where where are we at here? Right. Well, yeah, so talking about, you know, the disintegration of all the elements and, you know, all of that, um, the, I think what I would say is this, is that, you know, say before entanglement was discovered, uh, nobody thought that was the case. Nobody felt the universe was falling apart. So what entanglement tells us is it's possible to kind of take a small connect, a small element of the universe and thread it together so that it's unusually connected in a way that kind of goes beyond what's quote unquote normal. Right. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is that, yeah, that's absolutely true. That is the case, but it is not the usual. It does go beyond what's normal. And so it doesn't redefine what normal is. Um, and I think, I think the consequence of that is that like, so entanglement is neither what unites us all together, but nor does it mean that there's nothing else that's, active in the universe either right i mean so you know if we didn't think the universe was falling apart before we knew about entanglement then just because entanglement doesn't connect everything together <laughs> doesn't mean we should expect the universe to be falling apart now um yeah, in other so, words something's holding it together <laughs> yeah it's all i'm doing is i'm just putting a little bit of parameters around this entanglement thing so it doesn't you know move from two electrons to the entire observable universe in one jump um, yeah, it seems like there's a better explanations for deja vu or, you know, twin, two twins are born and they go in different directions. And, yeah, look, they, they have the same sort of behaviors or, you know, all, all the funny little things we've all heard. It's, whatever the cause of deja vu or a reincarnated, you know, claims of reincarnation or, or, or memories from other consciousnesses. Whatever the causes are, it's not quantum entanglement. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's genetic memory, like we talked about a few episodes ago, or maybe it's, you know, who knows? Maybe it's the magnetic poles, you know, or whatever, influencing animals a certain way. I mean, we we've, we discussed different ideas, but whatever it is, using quantum entanglement is is distorting the idea. Yeah, I, I just don't see. I don't see how it possibly could be. Um, First of all, like, I don't know how you could create an entangled space big enough where you could have things like memories and stuff, right? And like a memory is not held by one electron, right? <laughs> I don't, I'm not a neuroscientist. I don't know exactly how memories are stored, but I can promise you it's not held by one electron. And, you know, so like, what does it look like to get an entangled state that's big enough to carry a memory? I don't know, but even if that were possible, then you run into the problem that it's a temporary state. So once mm -hmm. the shared memory is somehow observed, then the state, the, the entanglement is severed and the system is going <laughs> to continue to move forward unconnected. All right. So, let, let me, let me sound like the meta, the metaphysical, you know, I don't know. Well, I'll just I'll, the metaphysical person. Okay, <laughs> please do. <laughs> you know, it's well, well, look, look, Putty. You know, it's like because of you know the quantum entanglement and all this quantum stuff shows us that the size doesn't matter. There is no you know, time and space. The spatial stuff doesn't matter. So, why are you limiting it to you know this this you know inferior size where this just won't work? Yeah. You know, so because you're you're, you're going to hear. You know, I think, you know, stuff like that. Right. And, right. and you know, well, if, if it's temporary, that that thought has to go somewhere. That memory has to go. So maybe it just switches to a different particle, <laughs> you know, or, or something like that. You know, right. you're, you're going to hear stuff like this. So how do you sort of. Yeah. And head so that I, off at the pass. I would say, yeah, that's great. Right. So I would say, um, you know, 
to to say that an entanglement means that time and space don't matter is to not really understand entanglement because these particles are only going to get entangled in time and space. They have Oops. to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There Once they are entangled, they they can they can do some interesting things that don't seem like they make a lot of sense in time and space. But we have to entangle them in time and space, and 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 so it's only because we can entangle them in time and space that we can make them behave oddly. <laughs> and so to to take that as an argument that time and space don't exist or something like that is to not not really understand the phenomenon. How's that? You like that? Oh, that just. That just crushed my world. <laughs> I'm I'm holding back tears now. You know, it, uh, you know. Again, you 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 hear these things, and and this is important because the the missing link. I mean, I'm sure there's more than one, but the the missing element here is just the the simple statement you just made. Well, we have to have them in time and space to do this or that to them. Because it's not like we can suspend time and space to conduct our experiment, right? You know that that's just not that's not possible. And even right. if someone turns around, and says, well, I, you know, sure, everything's possible. Well, they didn't do it that way because we don't know how to do that, right? <laughs> you know, it it's it's sort of a when you realize that one point, it kind of becomes a self defeating proposition because we can't do that. Yeah, yeah, and there's no way that I know to entangle things that doesn't take advantage of the reality of time and space to create that entanglement. Um, you know, whether moving something somewhere or using some time length to massage particles in some way, you have to use time and space to create entanglement. So, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and to take it a step further, like if people go up, people listening to this, go up and watch the video, it specifically says in the entanglement video, it's only a minute or so that, that because of this effect, because we're observing this effect, something to the effect that time and space are just sort of irrelevant. Right. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And and very much that is, you know, it's it's the thing where somebody's got their their metaphysical picture that they're reading into the science. I mean, it's the same thing as what people do with the scriptures, right? They've got a worldview that they read into the scriptures. Same thing, just with experiment instead of texts. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. The, the the worldview becomes a filter for the observation. Again, failing to distinguish the observation from ontological statements. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And I mean, un I, unfortunately, you know, I, I'm sure you feel the same way. If you, you just wish you could kind of like shake the person a little bit and help them see that that's what they're doing, you know, um, mm -hmm. but I don't know. It's really hard from the inside to see that somehow or, or something like that from the outside. It sure looks awful clear, but yeah. see, inside, for me, I would just, I would just say, okay, I'm going to take your Strong's concordance now and not give it back to you. <laughs> you <know>? Right. <laughs> well, right I, exactly. I, you, maybe you need to turn off the TV or so you tell people to turn off the TV or stop watching Morgan Freeman yeah. or, you know, yeah. just, just, you're not allowed to say quantum anymore. Just strike, <laughs> strike that one. <laughs> no, I, 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 you run into that. You know, and you feel kind of useless, you know, when when you can't you can't sort of help people to know the things they don't know so that they understand why you're not buying what they're selling. It's it, right. it's frustrating. Right. So kind of taking all of that, then I know we had talked about like visualization. Natalina, you have brought that up and, um, you know, the, are all romantic comedies rooted in quantum mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to kind of take this to the the real meat of ap application um <laughs> you know uh so you know yeah so i'm i i i've not read uh certainly anywhere near as much of the literature um natalina so so let me let me kind of just uh share the argument as i understand it um and yeah. then you correct me if i'm if i'm not right all right because i don't want to okay. be speaking out of turn here. Um, but, you know, my understanding of, of that kind of an argument is essentially this. Well, quantum mechanics, quote unquote, proves that, you know, everything is interconnected because of entanglement or something like that. Um, therefore, that means that I am connected to basically everything else in the universe. 
And if I can leverage that connection somehow, then that gives me kind of a, a window of uh, the ability to influence other things in the universe through that connection. So therefore, uh, you know, I'm going to use visualization because visualization is connected to my consciousness and consciousness is connected to quantum mechanics somehow. Um, and so I'm going to use my visualization to open the quantum mechanics door to leverage the universe so that I can make what I want to happen happen. Is that kind of basically the gist of the argument there? Pretty much. I mean, the argument for why visualization is a thing goes back to the role of the observer. You know, they try mm -hmm. to just sort of wind all of these things together. Right. And so I, as an observer, can can affect the way that these different infinite possibilities work. Then. Right. That also means that I, as the observer, who happens to also be connected to the universe and all of these different possibilities, should right. be able to simply pluck one of the my favorite possibility out and visualize that it is going to be my new reality, and then it will be. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's really the the the. The, and the reason I keep bringing it up as crazy as it, it all sounds is because it's such a prevalent way of thinking. I mean, right. man, it, it is, it is, it almost mainstream thought at this point, you know, you've got Oprah teaching this stuff. You've got all of these different, um, uh, self-help people that are teaching this as a scientifically proven principle. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, as far as I can tell, I'm I'm not a history of a religions uh, expert, and so I'm not going to claim that. But you know, from from what I can tell, this is this is kind of mostly a, a remasking of uh, like this is a new age set of ideas, which is sort of a a reframing, uh, maybe I should say, of a lot of Eastern mysticism, right? Exactly. I mean, this is kind of typical stuff that's been happening for a long, 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 long time. They're just throwing scientific labels on it, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, yep. And in fact, they'll, they'll, you know, pull these yogis out that'll be like, yeah, we've been saying this for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. You know, now science, now science confirms it. Right, right, yeah. So I would say there's a, a couple of, couple of snags with all of that. <laughs> um, you know, we, we talked about, I think, more the first episode, um, but I think it's come up since then, that um, observation is not necessarily re related to consciousness. Um, and, and to assume that observation and consciousness are identical is is um, a logical fallacy, I believe. Um, you know, so a good example, we've talked a little bit about CERN last episode, right? So when they make these observations at CERN, all that's happening is, is stuff is flying into detectors and getting logged on computers. There's no consciousness present at, at these observations. And yet the observations are playing the role of the observer in quantum mechanics. And so, um, the observer, I don't think, is something that we should necessarily see as personal. <laughs> um, yeah. The observer is more often than not a detector, <laughs> not, a, not a person. And so because of that, I think the link between observation and consciousness is fairly tenuous. The second, the second thing I would say with that is that the idea that observation alters a system is not the same thing as the idea that observation can adjust a system or can change a system in a specific way. Um, uh, you know, so for example, you know, I, uh, I'm trying to think of a, of a good example. Um, you know, if I, if I spin a quarter on the, on a desk, you know, it's, it's spinning upright for a while. It's not heads or tails, but at some point it's going to fall into heads or tails. And when I see that I'll have known that the system has changed. It's not, kind of in this hybrid state anymore, it's locked into heads or to tails, right? 
But that observation didn't force the system to do that. I didn't go, I want it to be heads, I want it to be heads, I want it to be heads. Or if I look at it and I want it to be heads, if I look at it, it'll make it become heads. Like there's a causality there that is not implied um, in quantum mechanics. And so, you know, if I come along and I like slam my hand down on the quarter and force it to be either heads or tails, then it changes the system. Absolutely. But it didn't change the system the way I wanted it to. It just changed the system. And I don't really have any input into how the system changed. <laughs> and in fact, what quantum mechanics, if you were actually honest with it, would tell you is that there's no possible way that you can make the system do what it want, what you want, because all of quantum mechanics is random until you make observations. So it, the actual premise of quantum mechanics, in my opinion, undermines that thinking, which is that like I can somehow force the system the way that I want it to be by observation when you know all of quantum mechanics outside of that kind of thinking says, the state is undetermined, like can't be pinned down, cannot be said to be anything until you observe. Like you, you can't nudge it because it, it, there is no, there is no way. Like it, it doesn't exist until it's observed. Is basically what quantum mechanics says. And so this idea that like I can push the system in a direction, you know, through observation, that's a foreign idea. That's not, that's not, uh, kind of, kind of what's there. If that makes sense. And so. You know, this idea that like, you know, we can we can visualize and, and manifest reality again. Yeah, it, it sure. I get it. It gets kind of flouted as, as quantum mechanics or whatever. But you have so many things that don't fit there. Like, you know, you have the issue of scale, which we talked about, like quantum mechanic things don't those effects don't scale up to human being sized things. Almost never does that happen. You have to work real hard to make it happen. That's why quantum computers are hard to make. Um, so you've got that. You've got like the fallacy of, you know, causation of events instead of the just altering through observation of events. You've got, there's just a lot of, a lot of snags in that, if that makes sense. And you, you can't even build a model, it would seem, for that. Because going back to your coin spinning illustration, okay, let, let's... We, we spin the coin a thousand times, we observe which face is up when it lands, and we record that. Well, the odds are astronomical that the next thousand spins are going to produce not only the same number of heads and tails, but in the same order. So how would you even, I mean, there, there's no way to predict that is, is what you're saying, but I, I like the, the, the coin spinning thing. To me, that's really helpful. Yeah. Because We've all done that, and we all know the, the virtual impossibility right. of any sort of predictability to that. And, and you know, to transfer that very obvious phenomenon that, that we're all familiar with mm -hmm. to the quantum world, I think, really makes the point. You, you can't, you know, to, to predict it, you'd have to tamper with it. <laughs> you know? you'd, you'd, have to, you'd have to do something to set it up. But at, at that level, you can't even do that. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you can't. You, you absolutely can't. And the the randomness of quantum mechanics actually undermines the idea that you can control it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, um, a, that's an important point. Yeah. And, and I think, I mean, you know, kind of talking about romantic comedies, I, I would even say the same idea kind of extends to fatalism. You know, actually, if, if you want to, to kind of argue metaphysics from science, uh, I would say that you have you actually have a hard time not becoming fatalistic until you come to quantum mechanics, um, because up until quantum mechanics, you have a very deterministic picture of things. Like if I mm -hmm. can just understand the setup of everything, you know, where everything is, where it's all headed, you know, then reality kind of determines like, you know, m marches forward according to a well-defined set of rules and everything is predictable. Right. I mean. That's kind of the picture until you get to quantum mechanics, at which point quantum mechanics says, yeah, forget that idea. Um, <laughs> that That's a nice thought, but it's not, not so much. And that's, the, that's what makes that's what makes quantum mechanics actually feel so grating um, when it comes onto the scene, because it kind of takes everything that we're used to with science and sort of 
throws it on its head and says, uh, well, you might think that you can have a deterministic universe, but you can't. Like, it's just not possible. Um, and so, if anything, you know, I would say quantum mechanics demonstrates that romantic comedies aren't reality. Um, not that we That's really good. need proof of that anyway, but... <laughs> <laughs> that's reassuring. <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right, we, we we should point out too that that what Nat brought up and what you're talking about is different than the old mind over matter. Even though the the new age, you know, community is going to say, well, what about mind over matter? You know that that's been proven. Well, if if you're talking about the effect of your thoughts on some you know, like brain plasticity or, you know, some, some other physical component of your body that that's really not the same thing because we, you know, that would be traceable to maybe something that as we're thinking a thought, the brain is working a certain way. Right. And then so it, it, the brain's connectivity to the systems in our body produces a certain result. So it, it, it's not the same thing than, yeah. or as, you know, what, what we're talking about here with entanglement. Right. Yeah. Or, or say another example, that would be like psychosomatic illness. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, which yes, is, is absolutely a different thing, but unfortunately, because like, because the people who are excited about this have taken the idea of consciousness and tried to take consciousness and like marry it to quantum mechanics through this observer thing, um, mental states wind up getting associated with quantum mechanics very, very highly, uh, or, or often frequently. That's what I'm looking for. And, uh, the, the, the problem is that like your mind exists on a scale where the quantum effects get washed out, you know, like <laughs> your, your, your thoughts, uh, you know, are, are exist in, in, in a non quantum realm. The rules of quantum mechanics aren't accurate descriptors of how the neurochemicals flow through your brain and your neurons fire and those kinds of things. It's not in the quantum space. And so as soon as you start arguing that kind of stuff, you're, you're kind of piecing together ideas, mostly at random. Don't you think that, you know, just because obviously most of these, these, uh, theories that I'm that I'm talking about are based on mystical experiences and trying to apply a scientific rationale to it. You know, for example, what they'll say, what we used to call magic, we can now accurately, with our understanding of quantum physics, we can now accurately call it causal engineering. You know, because we're realizing what we're doing is a scientific work rather than a mystical practice. And we're hearing these things. And once again, it, it does sound so outrageous that these people who maybe come from a place of Eastern mysticism are trying to prove their faith system with uh, quantum physics. But mm -hmm. isn't it cautionary too for those of us who are Christians who might be tempted to do the same thing? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I, I, I'm not a whole lot more comfortable with, um, you know, people using quantum mechanics, you know, again, I, I had mentioned that I'm a, uh, a charismatic, you know, in the last episode, mm -hmm. um, you know, so people could equally try and take, uh, you know, quantum mechanics and use that as the ex explanation for how the gifts of the spirit might work, you know, for example. Right. right? And, and I'm personally no more comfortable with that than, you know, the, the yogis grabbing it and saying, you know, this proves our transcendental meditation or, or whatever the case may be. It's, it's a, either way, it's a case of misapplying science in that you're taking ideas outside of the boundaries of the, where science can take them. Right. So there was a, uh, an experiment that was done. I think it was on the Canary Islands um, where they had like some sort of a particle beam thing or something. And they, and they managed to get one particle from one Island to the next instantaneously. You familiar with that? Uh, let me see if I can find it real quick. This was, I was watching this, I think it was a Brian green, uh, maybe like a PBS show or something where they were, they introduced this subject with entanglement and then, and then he took that to the idea of like um, Star Trek transportation of, sure, you know, other sorts of things. So what are your thoughts on that? 
and how it might relate to some of the things we're talking about here. Like it seemed to me in the in the video that he was making this leap that you've talked about many times now on our kind of the, these episodes that maybe something in the quantum realm you can get to do that. But as soon as you move up into the realm even of an atom, it doesn't work that way. And yet he was making it sound like, well, you know, with enough sophistication, we could we could find a way to get you know, zillions and zillions of these particles together that all make up a, whether it's a box or a human, and then we could, using quantum mechanics, teleport it across space. <laughs> right. So, okay, sorry, I, I was just uh, brushing up on that again real quick here. Like, you know, this is the kind of thing where you're, of course, you guys want to ask the most, you know, bizarre, interesting things, and, <laughs> and I want to be uh, responsible in addressing them. So, Okay, I got my head wrapped around the quantum teleportation thing, I think. What 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 exactly was the question again? Is that a precursor to, you know, Star Trek type human being teleportation or Yeah, I mean, you can apply it in all kinds of different ways. I suppose you could apply it on a on a physical level like Star Trek or you could maybe apply it on some sort of a um memory level it, it, it manipulating uh some sort of a memory thought from one place to another if you could figure out how to get it down to the quantum level or whatever mm -hmm. I, there's probably a lot of applications but it, i was just wondering what what do you think about the idea of moving that out of the um the quantum realm into the realm of <laughs> you and me right yeah um yeah so quantum teleportation basically um is it's it's kind of on the intersection of a couple of things we've talked about here what's happening is um Quantum teleportation is the idea of using entanglement to compute in, say, a quantum computing type situation. So if you entangle two things and move them into separate rooms, and then you're like, hey, I want to communicate this data to the other room, and you can somehow work with the entangled pair, you may be able to, to get data to quote unquote teleport from one room to the next. Right, right. Um, is the idea. Um, you know, so I I'll say a few things. Um, first of all, you know, if, we're, if we were going to try and, and ramp this up to talking about like, you know, whether humans can teleport with such a thing like this, um, you know, I, I think one of the, one of the uh, this is probably epistemological questions, if, if epistemology is the right word, I think it is here. Is the same set of atoms in the same quantum state as I am right now uh, identical to me? I think is is a question, right? So, so yeah, his his answer here, was yes, it is. That that was the answer that he gave. Right. Sure. Right. Yeah. So uh, 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 a materialist is likely going to argue that it is. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> um, I think I would be less uh, convinced of that, but. Uh, I would also probably have to think carefully, but the idea basically is you're not actually teleporting objects, you're teleporting information. And, um, you know, the question is, is it possible to teleport information in such a way where sort of all the equivalent of the information of me gets replicated in another state? Um, you know, is that the sum of who I am and so forth and so on? Uh, I don't know. That, that's that's maybe a question I could speculate on if you'd like me to. But um, to talk more concretely about what you're saying about like, does this mean that, you know, someday if I forget my lunch at home, I can just have it teleported to me? Um, I'd be surprised if that's ever doable. Um, like I said, you're running into some major quantum mechanics issues. And, you know, anytime that you're doing the kind of thing where you're trying to to replicate or move information or move an extended quantum state. That's what I mean. Move an extended quantum state. So like it's one thing to move an electron or a photon or something like that, right? But we're talking about, you know, an apple is, you know, some ridiculously high number of, uh, you know, of atoms. You've got, you know, billions upon billions upon billions upon billions upon billions upon billions of them. And, you know, the randomness of quantum mechanics really starts undermining you when you're talking about... <laughs> massive numbers of atoms and, and so forth in that size. Like, how do you, how do you possibly, you know, navigate the randomness that's going to creep into the system when you're dealing with, you know, 10 to the 20 plus atoms. Um, so I'll be surprised. Um, I think it could be developed commercially into helpful 
things uh, on the quantum computing scale. So it may be useful for um, someday, I would imagine not in the you know immediate future, but someday it might be useful for allowing us to save on our quantum computing power bill, you know, and uh, and just kind of teleport data from my uh, my quantum computer at home to my quantum computer at work, you know, or my quantum smartphone or whatever it is. Um, but I don't think uh, I don't think we're talking about object teleportation here. Um, the, the the sheer amount of information that goes into these objects is extremely prohibitive. Um, remember, one of the things that Einstein discovered for us, which is kind of mind bending, is that you know energy and matter are interchangeable, right? And so what that means is like we we tend to think of information as not having a quote unquote cost when it comes to matter, when it comes to, you know, like we, we tend to think of physical things and energy as the sort of ethere ethere uh, ethereal thing out there somewhere that doesn't really correspond to physical things, right? But if uh, information is, is basically always encoded in energy in some way, which means it is a physical thing. And so the amount of information that you're going to have to specify to replicate physical objects is really, really, really intense. Um, and then, like, how do you actually turn that information into objects and so forth and so on? It, it gets real complicated, real complicated. So uh, it's a cute idea. Uh, I'll be surprised if it ever becomes a reality. You know, <laughs> sure. um, My Michael Crichton, I don't know if you guys have ever read his novel Timeline. But mm -hmm. I, I hate to use the word realistic, but he was a little more realistic. Essentially, they, they, the people were not going back in time. They were like the, the, the metaphor that was used in the novel is it was like making a fax, you know, a fax yeah. of yourself, you know, to, to transport it, you know, to some different time. So it, it was you, but it wasn't you, you know, at, at that moment. And then, of course, in, in, in the fiction, you know, storytelling, there, that had a, a, an unfortunate effect. <laughs> <laughs> you know, over time, but he was kind of tracking on the sorts of limitations that, that you're talking about and then extrapolating from that. So at least it was more quote unquote realistic in that respect. Yeah. Well, let's, we, we should uh, wrap up our series here. I, I had promised in the previous episode to take a, a few minutes at the end here to ask the real simple question. Okay. What did we learn? Uh, mm -hmm. In other words, in all that we've heard, what are what are points of advice for what to say and not to say, or maybe I should put it this way: how to how to talk about uh, quantum physics as it relates to metaphysics or theology, and then you know beyond that, how how would you see what we can say applied to other subjects that we talk about here on on paranormal things like you know, new death, near death experiences, out of body experiences, you know, the whole precognition, deja vu. I mean, can, can it apply in any way or, or how, as we go forward and cover some of these topics, you know, we're, we're naturally going to have this series floating around in our heads, but is there, you know, sort of a way to just be more intelligent digesters of material that we read about some of these other things? based on our discussions over these last three episodes? I definitely learned that quantum physics is really, really, really hard. <laughs> it's really, really complicated, extra, extra complicated. And um, so I think, and I used this phrase before, but I think it's impossible to be an armchair quantum physicist. In other words, there are so many bits of... Um, uh, you know, clips in blog posts and even books and, and, and this type of thing that try to break it down to like a quantum physics for dummies. And you can watch it and think, oh, I, I get it. Like, I get that. That makes sense to me. I, it's not that hard. Chances are you don't get it, <laughs> even if it seems like it makes sense, because it's really extra complicated. So even if you have a surface understanding of of a principle of quantum physics, you probably don't have a full understanding of it. So you probably, um, unless you're a scientist, shouldn't try to teach it or necessarily apply it to your existing 
faith system because you're probably applying it incorrectly. And I think that if we've learned anything in these last three episodes, it's that there really isn't much of a correlation between between things that are happening on the quantum level and things that are happening in our reality or in our consciousness, in our spirituality. It seems that these are separate things. So I don't know that we could necessarily, um, with confidence, apply it to a lot of these topics that we discuss because it's it my takeaway is that it's this sort of other realm that we don't even know if or how it interacts with our understanding of reality if that makes sense Mm -hmm. yeah i think for me uh pretty much similar same thing but in different words is just reinforced to me the the importance of not tying one's um, metaphysics or theology or religion, religious beliefs to a scientific model. And, you know, I, I, I remember reading about this when I read Thomas Kuhn's scientific, the structure of st- scientific revolutions years ago. And I think it stuck with, with me and it came out strongly again in these, in these three sessions. And I mean, this, this goes beyond just, you know, uh, can we extrapolate uh, quantum physics out to justify our worldview, but I think it it applies a lot to to the Bible because you know we we come to the issues of like Genesis one and what we call scientific concordism, where many Christians try to make the Bible uh, connect to scientific theories, you know, like the day age theory or whatever, what have you, evolution or not evolution or you know six day creation, whatever. The the attempt to to uh, tie uh, scientific theories to the Bible is often very tenuous as well because you know I don't see the Bible being a scientific book in that sense. So I kind of see that connection bleeding into in, uh, into other areas as well. And and so I think it was very very helpful to clarify that. Yeah, and I, I would I would encourage people you know who you know who are Christians or have you know you know high view of scripture or whatever you know however they want to describe themselves to not be alarmed by what Brian and Natalina just said <laughs> be, because what 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 it comes down to is is actually something really simple you it goes back to the old well there's scientific inquiry and scientific evidence and then there's sort of legal inquiry or philosophical inquiry, you know, there, there's this, there, it's an issue of, of logical coherence. I mean, the different questions are testable in different ways. You know, different truth propositions are testable in different ways. Some truth propositions will conform very nicely to the tools of science and others will not conform at all. And that's the way it's always been. So deal with it. You know, you, you don't, don't, don't feel like you're you're forced to use the tools of science to prove, you know, some sort of proposition. And, and when you discover that you really can't, then, then you sort of have to abandon that proposition. Well, that, that might be a deeply flawed conclusion because not everything conforms to the tools of science. Just, it, it just doesn't. It's always been that way. It's not going to change because, you know, even within the realm of science, we've, we've run into several things here that, you know, Putty has just said, we not only don't know that scientifically, but we don't even really know how to test it, you know, that, that sort of thing, or even create a model. Or we can create a model, but we don't know how, you know, to, to really validate or invalidate the model. It, science has limitations. Okay, let's just face it. Let's just deal with it. And not every question conforms, you know, to, a, to one particular set of tools or, or trajectory of inquiry. Uh, so it's, it's not that you know, your, your faith beliefs or, or something that, you know, the Bible says, just because that can't conform to a specific, you know, methodology that, that, that operates in the realm of science doesn't mean that the proposition can't be tested in some other way. So pick the right method. And there was a really good quote. I think it was in, it was in one of the, the articles you had us read, maybe by Stenger, um, and he said, you know, while he disagreed that quantum physics really proved anything spiritual, it wasn't completely useless to the Christian life because what it does point at is design. And it and it can 
the intricacy of it all, almost to the point of over design, you know, and that we can look at it even just from that perspective, that there is such complexity in in um, matter and in all of these different systems that it's it's beautiful. So it's not disproving anything. It's actually just a beautiful example of design. I think for me, I had kind of two things and they were they're related to what Nat and Brian said, but I don't know that they're exactly identical. And they're both tied together by the concept of confusion to me. There's a lot of confusion in this world and a lot of confusion with what you read people talking about with quantum mechanics and whatever weird thing they want to get into. So I think it was the second episode. I was really struck with how the quantum physical world, uh, and we were talking about dimensions at that point, it's not the same thing to say something is spiritual or to say that it's in another dimension. And people confuse those two. And the other one is, um, and I think we saw, I saw this from the very first, like five minutes of our first episode, is how badly people confuse um, physics or quantum physics with metaphysics. And I think people, and I, I really want to try and be more aware of this myself when, as we move forward into other topics that when somebody mm -hmm. makes what they think is a scientific claim, what they're claiming is a scientific claim, uh, from what I've seen, chances are pretty high that they're actually not making a scientific claim at all. They're, <laughs> they've moved into metaphysics. And I think that's a, uh, that's something that we really need to be looking out for. Uh, anybody else? Putty, your your final thoughts? Um, I mean, I'm I just... I'm I, glad this is over. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, Thanks I for coming, it. man. <laughs> I, I enjoyed it. It's fun to to get a chance to, to discuss. Um, you know, you guys are really trying to be careful thinkers, and, and I appreciate that. Most of the time when I discuss this topic with people of faith, you know, they're they're looking for me to say the very kinds of things that we've been talking about and me saying we shouldn't say stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I really appreciate just being able to talk about this with uh, a group of critical thinkers that are that are doing their best to think honestly and carefully and, and not just kind of, you know, grab something to, to reinforce their faith because it's possible to get there somehow <laughs> or whatever it is. So no, I just I really enjoyed the talk, and uh, I'm I'm grateful for the chance to do it with you guys. Yeah, well, th well, thank you, and thank everybody uh, for being along for the ride. I think again, like I said last time, this I believe is going to be useful to a lot of people uh, over the course of time as they find this and listen to it. So, all of you in your uh, your social media channels, please direct people to these three episodes because I do think they will be really helpful. Thanks Bye. for coming. Bye, everyone. Thanks, buddy. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, buddy. You were great, man. Oh, thanks. It was a lot of fun. And hey, if there's any other way, um, you know, that I can help you guys out or whatever, um, just let me know. I was actually thinking, I was like, oh, we didn't even talk about like the big bang or anything like that. So, <laughs> um, you know, just uh, consider me a friend. However, I can help you guys out on your journey. All right. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>